who do you suppose set up the rules for rightly relating to a dinner table? Who got to pick that? Who got to decide the way we interact with a dinner table? I was not consulted. Now, these seem to me the kind of regulations, table etiquette, they seem to me the kind of regulations that were forged by nobility at some point in human history. You know, elites who have a lot of time to kill, and uh, just they strike me as that rather than something that is the production of, you know, peasants who are at taverns or their homes eating, you know, in order to live. Instead, you have people who put together elaborate plans for how one ought to relate to the dinner table. Table etiquette, we call it. Now, don't get me wrong, I, I do play by the rules handed down to me, but I have never been much of a fan of table etiquette. I'm not sure who got to construct the rules. As I said, I was not consulted, and that seems mildly unfair. <laughs> I can guarantee that whoever did make table etiquette rules did not have large arms. No elbows on the table. That rule had to come from somebody with spindly arms or short arms or a long torso, probably all three. If I can just state it bluntly, I don't think these institutions originated from large men. Can I hear an amen from some of the men in the congregation? <laughs> all right. Human beings are not all built the same way. And between table heights as well as chair heights, positioning can make large people feel rather awkward when dining with more delicate folk. When a person's arm length reaches a certain distance or a certain weight, and if said person has the unfortunate bodily combination, the anatomical combination of, oh, say, a short torso with arms that happen to be anatomically incorrect for them. My, my wingspan is 6'8". I'm 6'1". <laughs> All right. If that combination happens to be present, it gets rather difficult sometimes to manage cutlery as it's sitting in front of you. And speaking of cutlery... Who is it that decided on this as a formula for fanciness? The more cutlery that is present on the table, the more pleasurable the dining experience. That's not, by, that's not been my experience. I have never been in a situation where I'm eating and thought to myself, I cannot possibly eat what's in front of me unless I have a slightly smaller fork. <laughs> when I sit down and I notice more than five pieces of silverware in front of me, I just assume people are having fun at my expense. Let's see how the ogre handles this, right? It's uh, time to see how ignorant I am. Now, I, I think it's supposed to be working from the outside in when it comes to cutlery. Is that right? Yes? Okay, one person. That makes me feel better. Uh, but I typically just kind of grab whatever looks most utilitarian and then just set to work. If I am judged for my brutish ignorance, well, so be it. You got me. I have not invested the time nor resources to improve my knowledge of dinnerware. And realistically, I probably never will at this juncture of my life. The next time you see a guy who mildly resembles a silverback gorilla sitting at a table wedged <laughs> uncomfortably and looking perplexed while trying to follow basic table etiquette, extend that poor fellow some grace. When it comes to etiquette and dealing with one another in the family of God and in dealing with even God within the family of God, the regulations we follow are not arbitrary rules that were bequeathed to us by our dainty predecessors. These are not traditions that have their root in human preference. The directives of Scripture for disciples relating rightly to one another, they're directives given to us directly by the God of this universe, by the Holy Spirit of the living God. They are blessedly one-size-fits-all and created for maximal comfort and utility and accommodation of all the saints. We're going to be wrapping up uh, 1 Thessalonians this week. We'll be looking at Paul's final charges to these disciples. And the way this is going to come across is as a rapid-fire set of principles for relationships between disciples and their leaders, between disciples and other disciples, and between disciples and God. Before we launch in, though, let's go to our Lord in prayer. Master, I thank you that you did not um, leave relationship with you as a mystery. I praise you that that is revelation that has not only been given in your word, but is ongoing and also incredibly functional. And when we're doing it right, Father, I praise you that it just, it feels so good to be done right. Lord, I want to ask as we dig into your word today, again, Father, we ask that you'll help each one of us to retain something from the text that changes the way we think or the way we live, or hopefully both. Be with us as we study. 
Fill us with your Holy Spirit. We ask it in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. So today we're going to talk about disciples relating to leaders. Secondarily, we'll talk about disciples relating to one another. And lastly, we'll talk about disciples relating to God. This past week, my wife Lisa bought some fake, fake plants for our home decor. And I must say, I love when she purchases fake plants as opposed to real plants, because there's an addition happening to our house that I can't kill, right? They don't require upkeep. They don't require attention. Uh, it kind of reminds me of the, uh, the late comedian Mitch Hedberg. I don't know if you're familiar with Mitch Hedberg or not. He was sort of a master of one-liners. He once quipped, and I'll try to do it in his voice. My fake plants died because I did not pretend to water them. (laughs) Now, I suspect most of us would probably prefer that when it comes to interaction with other disciples and upkeep of the family of God, things were a little more like plastic plants. You know what I mean? Where you can't mess them up enough, or there's, there's not much you could do to mess them up. All they need is dusting occasionally. But that's not the way... It works when dealing with other disciples. We are all too organic. We're all too real. Soil and seeds and water and pests and germination. God probably actually created the whole concept of gardening just so we'd have a slew of good metaphors for dealing with one another. But I'd like to start out with just one metaphor today. When it comes to plants, the farmer can kill them through misconduct or neglect. That's true, right? But the plants can kill the farmer too. Without a yield, without produce, the farmer will starve. Leaders must care for the church, but the church also has to care for leaders. Let's start by talking about conditional appreciation as we get going today. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, we will begin in verse 12. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 12. Conditional appreciation. You know what conditional means, right? Depends on the conditions. Like, you only have to be appreciating a certain kind of a person in a certain kind of way. Now, what we mean by conditional appreciation here is that there are probably many people in the church who think of themselves as leaders, but who are excluded as being genuine spiritual leaders based on what Paul is about to say. Let's pay attention at verse 12. But we request of you, brethren, that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you and have charge over you in the Lord and give you instruction. So who's a leader in the church? Well, we just saw leaders are those who labor diligently. What do leaders do? Labor diligently. diligently. Have you ever watched a television show or maybe a movie? And you see the credit sequence. And in the credit sequence, you see the word producer or this one, executive producer. Have you seen that? Right, executive producer. Now, what does that name imply? They produce. They do, they do, they do they're supposed, if they're a producer, aren't they supposed to be productive? They're making something, right? But it's typically a well-known, not-so-secret piece of knowledge in the film industry that executive producers do exactly nothing. They do nothing, and they tend to take credit for it. They take credit for everything, and they do nothing. The church does not need executive producers. Amen. We've got no role for that. A title does not make a person a leader. Isn't that true? Paul's directive here entails this particular truth. When he says that those who diligently labor, he's he's excluding anybody outside of that category, which means if you've got somebody in the church who calls himself or herself a leader, but does nothing, they are not, in fact, leaders. The church has no need of middle managers. There is no consultant class in the church. The church needs everyone to be a laborer. Everyone. How many people need to be laborers in the church? Everyone. Do ministers labor? I thought those guys only worked a few hours on Sunday mornings. I get that joke all the time with a little nudge and uh, (laughs) good one. Now, I don't deny that there are probably some churches in which people function like that. I can tell you, knowing the staff at this church, that nobody on this staff functions that way. Um, I was only a few months into my first ministry when I contacted my former youth minister. And I said to him, can we meet halfway between our churches? I'd really like to have lunch with you. And so we did. We met at a Perkins, and as we sat down, I opened up with an apology. I said to him, I had no idea how much you did behind the scenes. (laughs) 
I told him about how my first attempted retreat had been an unmitigated disaster. (laughs) I talked to him about how much counseling he had to do and whether or not this was normal, whether this was the normal experience. I I talked to him about parents, and I'm like, did you have this much trouble with parents? And I talked to him about rebellious teenagers and about teaching issues, and he just looked at me and laughed. (laughs) Real Real ministry requires real work. And a leader who does not put in the time is not a real leader. So leaders are those who labor. But more than that, Paul gave us another qualification. Leaders are those who labor among you. Among you? Why would Paul have to clarify that leaders are those who lead in the flock? Let's put some feet on this in our culture. Christian leaders are not rock star pastors. Are you with me? Christian leaders, you know what I mean by rock star pastors? The guys who like show up on stage? And then they, they give you a sermon, and then they disappear, and you don't see them again until next week. And, they're not, and they don't know people's names in the congregation. They're not, like, they're not dealing with the congregation at all. Now, that person might be doing some work in the church, but that is not Christian leadership as Paul saw it. I don't think Paul would have recognized such a person as actually leading in the flock. Leaders in the church of Jesus Christ must be accessible to the flock and interested in the flock and working among the flock. So, really quickly, who did Paul just disqualify from leadership in the Christian sector? Those who do not work hard and those who will not affiliate with their congregations. There are no aloof executives in Christian leadership. Also, those who have charge. You ever put one of your kids in charge? You ever done that? Boy, they love that, don't they? I'm in charge. And then the kid who's not in charge, do they love that? No. Why? Because they're kids, and they're viewing leadership like kids view leadership. Which is where having charge means I have all the power and all the benefits and none of the detractions. Is that how real leadership works? Is that how real charge in the church works? 1 Thessalonians 5.12, let's look at it again. But we request of you, brethren, that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you and have charge over you. To have charge here is not an authoritarian relationship. This is not a person in position where they're just barking orders and they're the boss. To have charge in this context, the the phrasing here in the Greek means overseer protectors. Overseer protectors. These are people who have a responsibility for you and who are in a condition where they're meant to protect you wherever you happen to be. The elders and leaders of any congregation bear responsibility on how they handle that role, and that should be terrifying. James 3.1 says that those who teach will incur a stricter judgment. Anybody interested in a stricter judgment on Judgment Day? That sound fun? Hebrews 13.17 says this, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy and not grief, for this would be unprofitable for you. If you've ever talked to leadership in this church, and maybe you've had some conflict about some doctrinal issue or something else, you're like, why are you guys such sticklers? Like, why won't you just lighten up on these issues? The reason is because the leadership in this church knows that one day we will stand before the God of this universe and give an account for how we handled their word. That's terrifying. If you've ever thought to yourself that, I would just encourage you, recognize this is not a minor matter. When dealing with theology, like that's serious business and that's scary business. So those who have charge over you, those who labor diligently, those who labor diligently among you, those who give you instruction. You guys ever heard the phrase hocus pocus? We have no idea where that came from, by the way. Uh, We know where its first usage occurs. It's like in the 1600s. But the best guess at where the phrase hocus pocus, which is meant to be sort of these magic words, the best guess on where that comes from is from people listening to Latin services and going, those words sound magical. And then just kind of making up some nonsense words that went along with them. You guys seen Harry Potter? You've noticed that the words they use as their spells are pretty much just Latin that, you know, or some kind of derivation of Latin. The idea was this. The idea is 
What these guys are saying, it just sounds so mysterious and interesting that people then adopted it. But this is the problem. People would sit through services in Latin masses, and they had no idea what was being said. And so they would just sit there and go, I guess I'm being edified. I mean, I I guess something should be feeding me in the midst of this. It sounds weird. This is why it's rather important that you get to hear the gospel in your own language, our own language. Genuine discipleship leaders actually work among the flock. They've got a sense of protective watch care. But here's the thing. They actively teach and train. Actively teach and train. This means leaders are not rhetoricians. Leaders are not people who just stand up and wax eloquent so people can go, oh, that was a funny story. Or, oh, that was kind of nice. Or, oh, that made me feel special. That made me feel good. That's not the purpose. If you're sitting through a service and you feel spiritual or you feel entertained or you feel uplifted, that's awesome. But if you feel all those things and you have not been challenged, if your intellect has not been challenged, if if your concept of who God is has not been challenged, if you have not been challenged to live differently, then what you're getting is not leadership. So we've learned a lot about leadership. Now, how do you appreciate leaders? Let's again look at our text in verse 13. We'll look at verse 12 and 13 here. But we request of you, brethren, that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you and have charge over you in the Lord and give you instruction and that you esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Live at peace with one another. Esteem them very highly. I tell you truthfully, I knew this particular sermon was coming up and I was uncomfortable even thinking about having to stand up here and give a sermon that sounds very much like, hey, everybody needs to appreciate me. (laughs) These are the letters, these are the words of Paul to the church, and even delivering them, though, it does have this really awkward sense, because, uh, you know, I guess I fit that category, right, of leader within the church, and so standing up and telling people, like, esteem your leaders highly feels really awkward, kind of like, you guys need to treat me with honor, but recognize who he's talking about here. He doesn't say him, treat him with respect honor him, he says, them, right? And this is imperative for understanding this. Any church with a CEO, one person leader, is not functioning as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Leadership is a broad scale thing, and it requires people throughout the congregation to engage in this. I, I know for a fact that I could disappear from this congregation tomorrow, and this congregation would be just great. Because there are so many leaders and, and people who are doing the right things for the cause of Jesus Christ in this place. And it is a blessing to be working among such a church. Esteem them very highly because of their work. Esteem them very highly. What does that mean? Whenever you don't understand what a text means in scripture, do you remember the rule of opposites? Okay, so if you're having trouble like figuring out like, okay, how would I apply this? Flip it on its head and try to see what the opposite would be. Rather than esteem them very highly, it would mean esteem them very lowly. Esteem them very lowly or Value them or appraise them with little regard. Treat them like doormats. Treat them like they're beneath you. Now, why might that be a possible pattern that Paul has to warn the church against? Are we really in danger of treating leaders within the church in a demeaning fashion? Why would Paul have to say this? Because leaders in the church are meant to function like servants, right? So those who lead, that's what the term minister means. It means servant. The ones who lead are meant to be serving other people. And there's a danger that Paul sees in the church that as you view these people, that you begin treating them like your slaves. Let me try to illustrate this. And I just want you to see how wildly inappropriate this would be. Do you remember the sequence where Jesus is washing his disciples' feet? And he's showing them service leadership. I want you to imagine Jesus is just wrapping up the last disciple, he's scrubbing up their feet. And as he gets to the end, one of the disciples is like, um, um, excuse me, you missed a spot. Or maybe Jesus gets a strongly worded letter the next day from the mother of James and John, wondering why Jesus didn't start and end with James and John. And she chastises Jesus on not thinking about how it would make some, some people feel, by which he means her, that they weren't honored in this specific way. And why couldn't he think more of her and her feelings in particular? Imagine Jesus is in this position. He's just washed their feet. And they're like, how about you go get us some grapes? 
right? <laughs> Feed us grapes. Or why didn't we get oil poured on our heads and on our feet, right? Now, do you see how wildly inappropriate and awful that would have been? And yet, how often do we treat those serving in the church as though they are our slaves? Transgressing in this matter would look a little bit like this. And if you did this, I'm not picking on you in particular. Barking at the building and grounds team because they're not doing things the way you want them to. Talking to those who serve in the children's ministries as though they're your employees. Sniping at people because they're not conducting ministry according to your specifications. I remember my first ministry job, I was a few months into the job, when I received a call from an elderly man in our congregation who proceeded to yell at me for about 30 minutes. You know why he was yelling at me? Because I did not think to have the youth group come out to rake his leaves. He did not ask me to have the youth group come out and rake his leaves. He thought that I should have thought of that and that I should have put that into practice. And I was like, this is ridiculous. Everyone around me seemed to recognize it was ridiculous, but those kinds of things happen where people are like, how come you can't intuit exactly what I need at this exact moment in time? You should have guessed. If you really loved me, you would have known. Nobody in the church should be walking around barking orders and telling people what to do. Nobody in the church should be looking at other people going, serve more or serve more to my liking. The church did not need to hire you as a supervisor. That's not a, uh, it's not a spiritual gift. If you thought that was your spiritual gift to supervise the congregation, it's not. Um, next time you're approaching church leadership with a phrase, you know what you ought to do? Or maybe the phrase, I really wish you would just, just pause. Stop and go, am I, am I honoring this person? Am I coming to this person with any kind of reverence or respect? Am I esteeming them highly in the way I'm talking to them? Esteem your leaders. Live at peace with one another. Wait a minute, where did that come from? That's completely detached from the free, previous idea, isn't it? <laughs> Live at peace with one another. Do you know what the most profound way that you can encourage and esteem your leaders is? You want to make your leaders feel amazing? Love each other. Live at peace with each other. It makes all the difference in the world. The most profound way to bless your leadership is by living like they're instructing you to live as they bring the gospel forth. Easily the most discouraging part of ministry is discord and drama. I can tell you, nothing will so thoroughly crush the heart of a leader in the church as when people who are supposed to be disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, who have definitely heard the gospel, they definitely know what they're supposed to be doing, they decide in order to just entertain themselves in some petty fashion or some petty aggression to disregard all of that and turn on one another and attack one another. Parents, do you hate it when your kids just hate on one another and act petty and stupid? Doesn't, isn't that in discouragement? Don't you love it when you see your kids and they are just loving on one another and building one another up, building one another up and encouraging one another? Ever had that blessing? Try to empathize for a moment. Imagine you've devoted your life to the studying and articulating of the Word of God. Uh, imagine putting together teachings or sermons with fasting and prayer and study and dialogue with the God of this universe, filled with the Holy Spirit all week, coming together and delivering those words, right? Or imagine you've put together this, this worship set and this band practice and everybody's getting together and they're trying to bring an optimal worship experience or you're over there cutting out construction paper, though you're an adult, because you care dearly about these children and you want them to learn and you want them to receive this information. And then you come into a situation where you're ready to serve your fellow believers and for some reason or another, somebody is attacking somebody. Um, I can tell you, uh, blessedly, that I have rarely encountered such snitty behavior in this congregation. And I, I say that to your great glory as a congregation, because I know a lot of Christians struggle with these issues. I am not experiencing that at all right now. So if you were afraid I was about to use you as an example, <laughs> I don't know what you did. You know what you did. <laughs> this is why it's a good time for us to actually have this conversation. If you want to delight and encourage leadership in the church, Resolve your issues like Christ told you to resolve your issues with one another. Amen? Amen? Okay, so we've talked about relating to leaders. Let's talk about relating to the brethren, relating to the brethren. 
Uh, we have reached the end of Paul's first letter to the Thessalonian church, and you know what that means? Have you ever started writing a birthday card to someone? And as you're writing the birthday card, you start with those big, big letters, and you're like, happy birthday, you would, and then you start going, oh no, because you're running out of space. You know what I mean? And what started out as big letters starts getting smaller and smaller, and then you're writing up the side of the card, you're jamming those words together, because you've just got more to say, and there's not enough room to say it. Well, in the first century, parchment was hard to come by. Writing materials were very expensive. And so Paul couldn't just like go down to, you know, uh, Office Max and grab some more paper and just keep cranking it out, right? He had limited materials. And so what he's doing at the end of this letter, and you'll notice this in Paul's epistles, as he's getting to the end of the epistle, he starts just dropping these like boom, 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 boom. He's, he's like, these like two word sermons, you know what I mean? And he's giving these final greetings. He's bringing all this information really quickly. And that's what's happening here in this text. Now, these are not throwaways. What you're about to see in this kind of, this, what I'm going to call machine gun morality, is you're going to see Paul drop these really fast teachings, and he's just spamming all of these teachings at the Thessalonican church. Bullet point instructions, but these are not leftovers. There's meat here. Let's dig in. Machine gun morality. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 14. We urge you, brethren... We urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone. See to it that no one repays evil for evil, but always seek after the, that which is good for one another and for all people. Admonish the unruly. Everyone say admonish. admonish. What a great word. Admonish means to warn or to reprove or to correct. Uh, to put this in probably the most layman terms, it's you looking at another person going, would you get your act together? That's admonishment, right? You're calling somebody out. Like, Come on, get with it. And who are, you admon- who are we to admonish? Did you see? The unruly. The unruly. The disorderly. The term literally means the one who is out of ranks, as with soldiers. The person deviating from the prescriptive rule. The one who is out of step with the rest of the formation. You guys ever seen a, a marching band or maybe a group of soldiers? And they're all marching in lockstep, and all of a sudden, one person gets out of step. What's the one thing that you look at? It's just that person, right? A hundred people can be doing the right thing, but your focus is locked into the one person who's out of step, and you cannot not see them. This is what Christianity looks like to the world. Think about that. When the world looks at us, do they see the hundred people marching in lockstep? Or do they see the one who is out of step? And so it is with the world. We are judged. We are judged by our aberrations. Those who are not following Jesus Christ become representative of the whole community of the people of God. Reign them in or kick them out. That seems harsh. This is the idea with admonish the unruly. That person either gets in line and you got to start doing things the right way or you can't be part of the group, you're not in the marching band anymore. We're going to kick you to the curb. You might be thinking, yeah, but that's something that leadership does, right? Yes, leadership admonishes the unruly. It is the job of the entire church. As disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, you have a responsibility for the person sitting down the row from you and right next to you and across the room and in the back of the room and even those people from second service. We're to hold one another to account. We are to rein in people when they start getting out of control. The best time to prevent gossip is when you first hear it, not after it starts fires. The best time to help people empathize with one another is in the moment. Amen? Admonish the unruly. Encourage the faint-hearted. Encourage means, obviously, to give incentive, to calm, to console, to instill courage in an individual. And the idea of faint-hearted here is is cool. In the Greek, it's literally rendered as little-spirited. Little-spirited. Now, when I think of little-spirited, I think of Piglet from Winnie the Pooh, right? (laughs) I'm just a very small and timid creature. Now, that might be some of what's being spoken about, but I would suggest that Paul maybe is referencing something a little bit bigger than this. Who gets all the attention in the church? Well... There are those who are very outspoken and loud, like who talk a lot, 
Rachel high five me and you, right? All right. Um, but, and, and so there's some attention there, right? The people who are doing really good things, they tend to get a lot of attention in the congregation. But then there's also this other category of people who get a lot of attention, those people who are doing all the wrong things, right? And so they get called out and they get sought after and the squeaky wheel gets the grease and all that fun stuff, right? Or the squeaky wheel gets the kick, you know, however, <laughs> however it happens. But, but this, is, this is the nature of how the church works. Uh, any middle, middle kids in the room? Yeah, me too. Nobody cares. They, they just don't care. There are spiritual middle kids in the congregation, aren't there? Like there are people, like remember earlier in this letter, Paul says like make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. And there are people who are leading a quiet life, people who are not asserting themselves, people who don't desire to be in front of everybody, but they want to serve the church and they're still church serving the church and they're quietly sort of that middle child who's doing all the right things that nobody pays attention to. And so I think part of what Paul's doing here is he's like, make sure to encourage those people. Make sure to encourage those who are not standouts right now. Give them courage. Build them up. Show them attention too. Amen, middle children? Amen. Amen. (laughs) Admonish the unruly. Encourage the faint-hearted. Be patient with everyone. Um, We're not always good at being patient people. This is something I've tried to do as I get older. Um, I try to wait before I talk. That's hard, isn't it? I think Jordan Peterson does a great job of this. Have you ever seen him get asked a question? He'll be asked a question, and he pauses, and he just stares for a moment. And you can just see the gears, you know, as he's going, like, here are 30 ways I could come at this topic, right? But, like, it's, there's so many of us that just immediately, we, we immediately start speaking as soon as the other person is done talking. And I, I think it's, it's the Christ follower who is patient with everyone at the level that they slow down and go, okay, not what I want to say. What does this person need right now? How can I best minister? How can I best serve them in this circumstance? Being patient with everyone looks a lot like giving empathy and pity, life coaching, and time. Because we all need that, right? Who, who wants for others to be patient with him? Just me? All right, the rest of you, I'm just going to treat awfully. <laughs> Every single one of us desires other people to treat us with patience, don't we? So put it into practice. With everyone and with all people, no malicious paybacks. That's our next instruction. Verse 15. See to it that no one repays another with evil for evil, but always seek after that which is good for one another and for all people. It rhymes. Who's this instruction directed at? You might be thinking, well, malicious people, right? Isn't that who we're talking to? No, look again at that. Who's getting this instruction? This is the, this is, these are the people who are not engaged in malicious back and forth. They're not engaged evil for evil. These are other, these are bystanders in the church, and we're being told, involve yourself when you see people heading in the wrong direction. Did you see that? See to it that no one repays. That means you, as the person who's not involved, need to look around and go, uh, time to be a peacemaker and step in and help fix situations before they get out of control. Whose responsibility is that? Is it just the leaders? No, it is all the disciples within the congregation. See to it, or seek the good of all inside the church, that is one another, and outside of the church, of all people. Make it your ambition to be a relationship fixer and a people fixer. Take peacemaking seriously in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Communicate communion. Let's skip down to verse 25. Um, We'll come back to the middle part. I'm not going to just skip that entirely. We'll save that for our third point. Verse 25, Paul says this. He says, pray for the proclaimers. Brethren, pray for us. That strike you as weird. Think about it for just a moment. This is Paul the apostle. This is Paul the scholar. This is Paul the miracle worker. This is Paul the exorcist. And he's looking at the anybodies in the church at Thessalonica, and he's going, would you, would you just please pray for us? We need your prayers. Every human being serving in the church, particularly those proclaiming the gospel, 
need to be shrouded in the prayers of the saints. Do you pray for your teachers and leaders in this congregation? Do you pray for our missionaries? Missionaries, teachers, preachers, counselors, everyone serving the brotherhood needs prayer from the congregation. So here's a good application for this week. You want to put wheels on this? Set a timer during the week and just the timer should just say like leaders, right? Your alarm goes off and you know at that moment, I pray for leaders within the congregation. Can you do that? That'd be awesome. That'd be amazing. Pray for the kids teaching your preschoolers. Those people need prayer. <laughs> Show affection for one another. First Thessalonians 5 verse 26. Greet the brethren with a holy kiss. Holy kiss? Pucker up, buttercup. Uh, This tends to be one of those commands we blow past. And honestly, I was prepared to just roll on by this without thinking about it too much. But then I just went, how often is that instruction given in the scriptures? It's given multiple times. This isn't isn't a one-off. It's here in 1 Thessalonians 5.26. It's in Romans 16.16, 1 Corinthians 16.20, 2 Corinthians 13.12, and 1 Peter 5 verse 14. Greet one another with a holy kiss. Uh, the youth minister I mentioned uh, earlier in this message, he once told me a story about his uh, experience in Bible college. He said, at one point in Bible college, uh, they began a, uh, a campus petition to bring back the holy kiss. <laughs> Apparently, a, a lot of the young men training for ministry were longing for some physical affection from their female classmates. The term, though, of import here is, is, and this is the key word in understanding this, holy, (laughs) holy kiss, as opposed to romantic kiss or creepy kiss, right? (laughs) The term holy specifies purity of motive and function, which means if a person could not kiss you in a way that was holy, that was sacred to God, then they are not to be kissing you. Amen? Amen. Amen. Stronger amen on that than some of the other ones. (laughs) To qualify practice here, I would say in the same way, though, that being guarded against um, too much affection with members of the opposite sex within a church body, we should guard against any appearance of impropriety within the church body uh, or the possibility of jealousy within the church body by being careful how these things are handled. Um, Generally, in our culture, we don't kiss one another. Some of you within a family might have kissed family members, right? Maybe father or mother uh, kisses on the cheek. That's a little bit more normative. Um, but still, some of you within your families probably did not kiss other members of your family other than maybe like a spouse, right? And so for most of us, we hear this, and it's like, that's a little weird. I'll tell you, in every church I've been in, I get kissed. Uh, Usually grandmothers, older women, uh, kiss me on the cheek, and which is cool, because like, I think they look at me as like a a grandson or something else. Uh, John Piper says that he makes it a point when he's in the hospital to kiss old ladies, kiss them on the forehead, kiss them on the cheek, right? And the idea is just, we need to express love for one another, right, as a church. But here's the problem. Like, so many people come from broken backdrops with their families that they've got no place where anybody loves them. And this is one of those features that is supposed to be prevalent in the church, where there is a place where everyone is treated like family. Now, in case you're concerned that I'm going to make everybody kiss everybody else in this congregation, (laughs) I would just say, in our culture, this is not normative. In our culture, if I were going to render this to our culture, I would say, Give one another a holy hug. All right? It should be normal for people in the church to hug one another. That's a family thing to do, right? And this should feel like family to everybody who's here. Now, if you came up in an environment where you did not have familial affection, I'm so sorry. That's not the way God intended it. But this should be the place where you get that. Amen? Yeah. Amen. Holy hugs. Sounds good. If you're like, I'd rather just have a holy handshake. <laughs> I, I get it. I know where you are, but I hear, I'm, I'm going to tell you, I think what Paul's asking here is for you to lean against that. I think Paul's telling you, get out of your comfort zone a little bit. And even if you haven't experienced this in your own family, make this the place where you start receiving affection from other people. And some of that is just getting close to other people enough that you start talking. And when they come in for that hug, you go, all right, here it comes. Here we go. <laughs> and pretty soon it's normal. Amen. 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 All right. Verse 27, read our letter out loud. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 27, I adjure you by the Lord. Man, that is intimidating. (laughs) I adjure you by the Lord. God's paying attention. Have this letter read to all the brethren. 
Now, I don't think there's any real profound hidden principle here. I think Paul's literally just saying to the church, like, hey, guys, this isn't just a message for the leadership. I want everybody to hear my words to this congregation. And so even to this day, here we are, still receiving and talking about these words. But think about what he's saying here. See, there are many people in the church at Thessalonica who did not know Paul. They had never met him. Because the church has continued to spread in advance since Paul's been gone. And so some people have heard of Paul, but they've never heard from Paul. And so Paul says, hey, make it a point that when I send you guys this letter, this is not kept just among people who know me. Make sure everybody gets to hear this letter. So let me go ahead and make a weird application here. Secondhand communication is secondhand companionship. Secondhand communication is secondhand companionship. Now, wouldn't it be great if we had firsthand companionship? Sure. But here's the deal. If you could have your friends and coworkers meet the pastor or the teachers or the elders of your church, wouldn't you want them to experience that? If you could get them, you kind of can. When you talk one story at a time, or one anecdote at a time, when you allow your life among the family of believers to start entering your life outside of the family of believers by just talking about it, people start feeling like they know the people that you know. Communicate in that way. Okay. Relate rightly to leaders. Relate rightly to uh, other disciples. Relate rightly to God. In premarital counseling, uh, one of the exhortations I typically give young couples Go ahead and take a moment. I made that one. I'm kind of proud of that one. In premarital counseling, I I give this exhortation to a lot of young couples. Do not make your soon-to-be spouse guess what you need. Communicate to them. If you try to make the other person guess what you need and guess how to best relate to you, it is a recipe for disaster. If somebody tries to make you guess, don't do it. Just say to them, please communicate clearly to me what you need from me. And do not make your spouse guess. Do not hold them accountable for things they could not possibly know without you telling them. Amen? Playing that game is, uh, is only going to have losers. I will tell you, and this is so wonderful, we have a God that does not play the guessing game. We do not have a God who steps back and with his arms crossed goes, if you really loved me, you would know what you did wrong. It's not happening. God has told us how to best relate to him. And in fact, the scripture passage we memorized last month is just such an indication. God saying to you, this is how we rightly relate to one another. Let's remember that passage from last month, 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. Let's read it together. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Rejoice always, or be joyful always. Joy is a state of being. Rejoicing is activating that state of being. Okay, so joy is the state. Rejoicing is creating that state. Can you create a state of joy? Yes. Joy is a gladness or happiness or thriving of the heart mixed with anticipation. Gladness of heart with anticipation. If you believe the gospel message, those two things should be present in you. Amen? Here's something I discovered this past week, and I would love it if we change our culture in the church in this direction. In the first century, one of the most popular greetings among Christians, Christian to Christian, was rejoice. One of the most popular ways to say goodbye was rejoice. How cool is that? Can you imagine coming in and getting that hug? Rejoice right there in your ear, right? Be filled with joy. Why? Because I know the gospel message. Because I believe that Christ has come and redeemed me. And I know my future with him. Rejoice. Amen? Amen. I'm going to make my day bright this week when we see one another at Kroger's. Rejoice. (laughs) Amen. Rejoice always. Pray continually. Um, unending prayer might seem like an ambitious goal, but remember what prayer is. Prayer is communion with the God of this universe, being in God's presence. Does that involve talking? Sometimes. All the time? No. 
Thank the Lord, otherwise we could not carry out this particular command. Pray without ceasing means you spend forever in the presence of God. He's, he's with you at all times and all moments, so as soon as you turn to have conversation, he's right there ready to jump in. And you can also sit quietly together and walk quietly together and go with one another wherever you are. And he's in the car with you, and he's at work with you. Pray without ceasing. Thirdly, in everything, give thanks. When you embrace the truth of the Christian message, gratitude naturally emerges all the time. If you have come to understand Jesus Christ and know the gospel, one of the things God should hear from you 10, 12, 20, 30 times a day is thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you so much. Thank you. By the way, if you're a parent, your kids should hear you saying that on the regular too. They should see you recognizing the God of this universe. Charles Spurgeon said this. I love this. When joy and prayer are married, their firstborn child is gratitude. If you have joy, if you have joy, if you have prayer, then of course gratitude is going to emerge. Now note that this does not say give thanks for everything. You are allowed to hate your circumstances. Amen. All right? Because there are sometimes you look around and you're like, I'm not really thrilled about what's going on here. You do not have to give thanks for everything. You have to give thanks in everything. What's the difference? The difference is you could be in a circumstance that you absolutely loathe. And you could say a prayer to God of thanks. It sounds something like this. I thank you, Lord, that this garbage circumstance is not the end and that earth is not my permanent home. I thank you, Lord, that you have gone to prepare a place for me. That is thanks in all circumstances. Amen? All right. So relate to God by being joyful always, praying continually, giving thanks in all circumstances. But then he goes on to talk about being careful with his message and his messengers. Look at verse 19. Do not quench the spirit. Everyone say quench. Quench. Mean to quench. Boy, that was a lot of shh at the end. (laughs) Quench. To quench means to extinguish or put out. When God is busy at work, when God's doing amazing things in people's lives, we are not spiritually charged with being the wet blanket. Wait, are you saying that we could really stifle the work of the Holy Spirit? Why else would Paul give this warning? If it's not possible to violate this, why would Paul warn us against it? Do you believe in the Holy Spirit of the living God? Yes, okay, I hope so, because it's part of all Orthodox Christian faith. And do you believe the Holy Spirit is active in the lives of believers and in world history? Do you believe that? Yes. Well, then be careful not to stifle, inhibit, or otherwise get in the way of the Holy Spirit. Now, you might be asking questions. First question I asked when I thought about this, how does that happen? Like, I want to avoid that. How do I avoid that? Look at the very next verse. This might be a little challenging for some of us, depending on your faith backdrop. Verse 20, do not despise prophetic utterances. But examine everything carefully. Hold fast to that which is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Regardless of what you might think about prophecy in our day, the first century church, the Holy Spirit was very active and prophetic ministries occurred all the time. Read the book of Acts. You'll see prophecy all over the place. But there's a strong word that's used here, and that's despise. Despise. Despise means make no account of, esteem not, or find contemptible or ignore. The idea is this, a word from the Holy Spirit could come forth and you could be the type of person who's like, "Ah, I'm not paying attention to that, or hate it, or disdain it. Now, what would possibly make someone uncomfortable with prophecy? Well, I can think of a lot. Often prophecy is cryptic in nature, right? You've read the Old Testament prophets and you're like, what on earth are those guys talking about? (laughs) There's a lack of control. Look, if God is speaking in our circumstances, that's a little bit scary. I can't control that. And it's potential abuse. Let's be honest. If you've been part of the church for a while, you have probably run afoul of somebody who said, you know what God told me? And they were lying, right? And so there is this certain wariness that ought to be present in all believers. Uh, Some Christians will say when they look at this command that this is not a command which we should have to um, regard in our day and age because prophecy is not present in the church. They believe that at some point in human history, prophecy went quiet and that it's not going to reemerge. Um, I would not personally be comfortable with going that far for the same reason we just mentioned. Look, 
I do not want to quench the spirit. If God's trying to speak right now, I don't want to be the person who's like, uh-uh, you don't get to do that. I am open to prophetic words, but I am cautious with regard to prophetic words. I would suggest to you that that is a good condition to be in within the church for all the aforementioned examples. I think this is specifically what the command is, that is being given here is saying. Examine everything. Hold fast to that which is good. Abstain from every form of evil. To put this in my father's words, eat the fruit, spit out the seeds. Right? Some people are going to say things that are right and righteous and that that is of the living God, and I'm careful with that. Sometimes I hear something and I go, no. As a Berean, I'm recognizing this contradicts the word. That cannot come from the Holy Spirit. Take it to the curve. Okay, we're going to close out today by doing something maybe a little bit weird for you. I want everybody to stand up really quickly. Time for holy kisses. I'm kidding. We're not going to, we're not going to do that. As we're wrapping up 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, um, we're going to be looking at verse 23 and 24, and this is a, a pronounced blessing from the Apostle Paul. Now, if I asked you to help lift up a refrigerator with me right now, Okay, here's what we would do. Like we would ready ourselves and you would tense up and you would get down and you would put your weight behind what we were about to do, wouldn't you? Okay, so when we're praying as believers, you are a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. You're filled with the Holy Spirit of the living God. When you speak a word of blessing, it has weight and power. Okay, so set your will to pronounce blessing and here's who you're gonna bless. You will be blessing me and you'll be blessing the other people in the room standing next to you and across the room and around this room as we pronounce this blessing. Put your weight behind it, right? Spiritually ready yourself to do this. And I will be up here doing the same thing and blessing you. Let's pronounce blessing now from the word. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23 and 24. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. And may your spirit, soul, and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he who calls you. And he also will bring it to pass. Let's pray. Lord and God, thank you so much for this family. Father, we want to relate rightly to leaders within this church, rightly to one another, and we want to relate rightly to you. Father, I pray that you'll sear into our hearts and minds the lessons we take from 1 Thessalonians. Help us to conduct ourselves as your disciples. We ask it in your name, Lord Jesus, and all of God's people said, Amen. 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 God bless, guys. If you liked what you saw here, go ahead and click on that like button. And while you're at it, for more great content, go ahead and subscribe to our channel.